my I have two PhD students here, Jun Wang and Elan Jha, who are absolutely co-authors on this. But we decided my own research has focused for decades now on suburban redevelopment, the retrofitting of suburbia. So we wanted to look at kind of ask the question. There's been a lot of media attention about the urban doom loop. So we're looking at how work from home has actually impacted urban ground floors and suburban ground floors, because all the media attention has been on San Francisco and New York and the, the major cities where we've seen how work from the, this doom loop, work from home has meant you don't have enough employees in those urban centers supporting all of the ground floor shops and restaurants and more and more of them are closing. And as they are closing, then the streets feel less safe and you've got the combination of a whole lot more now of un an unhoused population often taking over those streets, perceptions of crime and safety and that just driving even more work from home and, uh, and that, that being kind of this, the, ur the do urban doom loop. So part of what we wanted to do was just try to figure out, well, what's happening with suburban office? Because the reality is actually way more employment is in the suburbs than is in, in the US, than is in those urban cores. Um, we're at, at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, where it's only about 7.3% of jobs are in are the commercial core. Uh, we, it's a sprawling city. I mean, most of the U.S. population majority live in the suburbs and yes, all the jobs, job sprawl is a big thing. So we thought we would um, ask questions like, you know, how, how have the ground floors been impacted in the more suburb places of more suburban form? Did work from home harm or benefit ground floor retail more in walkable urban environments or in drivable suburban environments. Um, we all, I imagine as urbanists, almost everyone in this room is living in a more walkable urban place. And I know I saw, um, you know, amazing support from my neighbors walking in, there was so much more walking and biking at kind of the end of the day during the lockdowns, everyone kind of going out uh, and often really do, supporting deliveries, you know, this, whether it's the streeteries or whether it's the, uh, it's really supporting their local neighborhoods. And kind of wanted to see, is that really a story? Is that happening? So uh, I am the, case study of suburban retrofits person. My PhD students are total data geeks and I, I bow um, to them for their assistance on this. So what we tried to do was to use some novel quantitative methods to examine work from home on both urban and suburban ground floors in Atlanta, uh, you know, not a, a, a very suburban city, we focused on the five core counties, as well as the five largest office centers, call them office parks, but we're looking at census tract data. And we then tried to also, uh, lots of interviews, qualitative interviews with leasing agents, developers, residents, um, office, business owners, uh, and reading just a lot of the sort of professional literature that's out there to see, to really try to figure out what the strategies that folks were using. So again, the question of sort of what about suburbia? Um, so a little bit of just general info. You no, know, yes, there has been a suburban migration in the US out of cities. Uh, the strongest population growth between 2020, 2022 was in the suburban counties located around the nation's largest metro areas. So the bigger the metro area, the more migration, but it wasn't out, there's a lot of exurban growth, but it's actually, uh, if you kind of just take any major city and divide it into fifths, it's gonna be not the most outer fifth, it's the fourth, third and fourth kind of where those rings. Uh, and, that's where I'll, where, so we'll, we'll talk a little more about it. commercial and residential rents 
rose in the suburbs at the same time they went down in the cities because there was enough of this, um, but both migration, but also I think work from home. In 2022, for the first time ever that I am aware of, downtown office vacancy rates surpassed the suburbs. The suburbs always had more churn, but not, not with the pandemic. So at the same, then, and what, yes, this, we believe that this is due to where a lot of this from work from home. So work from home tripled from 2019 to 2021 nationwide. Um, there's a group out of Stanford that have been looking at it a little more fine grained than what the American Community Survey does. And they argue that it's actually was a five fold increase up to till today with 40% of US employees remotely working at least one day per week. Uh, by early 22, Pew Research Center, I think this indicated a pretty significant thing. More work from home was by choice than necessity. So the strict lockdowns and how much they were enforced, we saw in Atlanta, if the closer in neighborhoods really enforced lockdowns, um, the more suburban, further, almost rural areas mm, thought it was a, a, a fraud and were less likely to. Um, so there were also more retail openings in the suburbs than in downtown. Uh, there's a really interesting study from JP Morgan Chase, credit card data in 16 major cities. They found that retail establishments paralleled the exodus of populations from large expensive cities to smaller sunbelt cities and suburbs. And they sort of see map the, for grocery here. You can see it's, uh, there's a lot of new grocery out in those outer suburbs because there's enough new population growth. But the restaurants, it's really peaking in that kind of inner suburb, not quite as outer. Um, uh, a lot of these home goods, uh, personal care services. We're seeing where what kind of retail. So we're trying to sort of figure out the ground, what does this mean for ground floor retail? Um, and I'm just gonna sort of say, adding on to, I think uh, Gary's uh, mentioning of the sort of dead malls and the retrofits and town centers, just sort of showing a little of what has been an example, because we had to, I wanted to show some ground floors, not just charts. Um, so this is one of, I, I have about 2,500 uh, examples in my database of suburban retrofits. This one happens to have been originally built as a, uh, a, a drive-in movie theater. Then it was replaced in the 80s by a cinemaplex. Then there was a murder. Nobody went to the cinemaplex again. It died. <laughs> And it's been reinvented as this mixed use town center that as I'm seeing in a lot of these, this is one of the better examples, I think, but really activating the ground floors with very small, fine grained boutique retail, then two floors of parking and then a target discount department store on the top. And they did this with their movie theater, same thing. They're putting the big suburban stuff on top of the fine grained stuff. So they're getting some really pretty great walkable streets, lots of seating, lots of invitations to linger. Um, and they also, you know, making a town green. Now it's AstroTurf. It's only a one acre, lots of storm water stuff uh, underneath, but it's programmed by putting an LED screen on the mo big movie theater so that they can have um, yoga classes in the morning really cheaply because you're just projecting it on the movie. They Every sports team game at night. Um, the motivation of the uh, CEO of this company who specialize in, they're one of the largest developers of grocery anchored strip malls. Uh, she wanted to try making a more mixed use town center after she heard our at then um, a, a, a surgeon general declare the US in a loneliness epidemic. And so that having a spaces for the gathering of community, really trying to get, I mean, that was her motivation on really trying to do this. And she can measure where people are coming from, how they're 
the she can measure license plates and um, how many of them are then shopping. Uh, but it's sort of an interesting, just one kind of example of this is the kind of suburban retrofit. Yes, a lot of the people, probably most of those moms and their kids drove from the residential suburbs to this as a more walkable, more social gathering space. Uh, but I've visited like six times over probably six years, seven, eight years, and it's always packed. So that kind of gets, a, that's just an illustration of some of the sort of mixed, the, the you know, that's happening a lot, this redevelopment of the suburbs. That was already happening pre-pandemic, lots of it. Uh, as response to just more and more retail, dying, online shopping, trying to provide the experiences you cannot get online, um, experiences of community, much more, uh, and, and the kinds of services. So, you know, but not, we've seen a lot of retail dying, again, even before, but COVID just exacerbated the online shopping, the supply chain issues, now even inflation. So we have thriving retail, suburban retail, but we also have a lot more shopping malls that are absolutely dying. I included this one because it's sort of the closest here to uh, Boston in Eastfield, Mass., where the Macy's is being turned into um, cannabis production on the top floor and uh, sales on the ground floor, and then also adding a bunch of retail and things. But it's, you get these just mixed trends. On the one hand, we're seeing so many malls dying. And my data, I just asked Gary, we've got different sources on our, on our data of, of how many dead malls there are. But, um, I am tracking about 500, I'm tracking over 500 right now that are in various proposals of retrofitting. There are about 85 that have already become more or less mixed use places. Um, so, you know, you've got malls that are dying and, it's, and then at the same time retail that is kind of flourishing that is more, some of which looks like what I just showed that is more sort of pedestrian oriented really a uh, great ground floor walkable retail. And yet the biggest, most um, successful new retailer in the, since the pandemic are dollar stores, which are fronted by big parking lots and mostly they're sometimes going into main streets, but uh, that is in convenience stores, grocery anchored strip malls. Those are really what have done the best in, um, in the pandemic. So yeah, this is more urban. Is urban winning the game? Is suburban winning the game? It's hard to tell. Um, I mean, office, there's also, we see counter trends. Um, during the pandemic, in addition to the office vacancies and subleasing happening off, you know, the, the, a lot of them were actually moving back into cities more urban locations as part of the flight to quality. They were taking advantage of prices, have it, re rents having been reduced during the pandemic. So Canary Wharf, which really is, you know, kind of outside of the city, <laughs> it's, it's, it, you know, has now a lot of those, those um, offices have moved back into the city to uh, smaller, more central premises. We see that in Atlanta um, as well. It's a pretty big trend. So, you're seeing office wanting amenity rich urban locations as the way to try to seduce employees to come back into the office. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing a lot of office just dying and, and not uh, doing this. So given these, nat these confounding trends nationally, we said, all right, let's look at Atlanta and see if we can figure anything out. Um, so first thing we did was try to categorize Atlanta's, the, the built form characteristics of every census tract in the five county area. Um, so we co collected and calculated various measures you can see in the blue uh, that are really, you know, trying to look at uh, density, diversity, connectivity, and centrality as a way to get at kind of urban versus suburban, we then process them through the K-means clusters model to group those with shared characteristics. This produced five 
k-means categories with varying degrees of more urban versus more suburban built environment characteristics. And so as you can see, uh, we get a little bit of downtown, a lot of kind of old streetcar suburbs in this darker green, and then some of the small towns showing up in the dark in that uh, darker green. But we get a whole lot. These first three categories, <laughs> one, two, and three, are very suburban. They're just slightly different versions. <laughs> the outer edges, and you can see by the size of the census tracts clinging to the outsides of the map are the, the lowest density, the lowest connectivity. Uh, then you get a kind of middle ground that are generally the newer, somewhat the older suburbs and they're a little smaller lots. And then you have also a whole lot of the newer, bigger lot. So it's very mixed pattern, but you know, it, Atlanta is a suburban metro. So it's not too surprising. Uh, we then compared the K-means categories to new urban, the new urbanist rural to urban transect and, and found, yeah, this is, this is working. It's not a one-to-one, -one, but, um, but we think there's some, some hope in kind of trying to understand this. And then in blue, we're looking at where are those five largest office parcels, uh, the office districts. And they're all, you know, four of them are very suburban, very suburban areas um, with one downtown. We looked at safe graph POIs to map Atlanta's employment. I'm gonna kind of just rush through this. Uh, we looked also, we kind of characterized um, the employment and we distinguished, tried to distinguish ground floor retail as that which is relatively close to the street. So we measured a threshold because uh, we could quantify that from non ground floor retail, which we assumed was either raised or set back. And so the retail that's fronted by a surface parking lot, we're trying to um, use that as a way to distinguish. So we looked at closures of the ground floor retail and the non-ground floor retail. And we can see that really 30% of those retail closures are ground floor retail and they're clustered in those employment districts, especially in the downtown and midtown. Uh, we also looked at distinguished the residential work from home rate versus the workplace work from home rate. Um, and finding that the workplace work from home rate is actually the median is slightly higher. Um, so they're just, we're, we're kind of fishing here. Honestly, we're just looking and see what, can, what, what do we find? What do we see? Uh, census tracts in the center of the region declined in retail traffic by more than 20%, while the peripheral, actually some of them even gained uh, more foot traffic. Um, so, you know, we, it, it really was not proving what we were hoping kind of to find uh, that, that wa more walkable, closer in neighborhoods were um, re ground floors were doing well. So uh, this one really where we zoomed in on the five largest office center tracks probably I think provides the clearest evidence yet that work from home did indeed impact ground floor retail in suburban office as negatively as in the downtown offices from 20 to 30% decrease in foot traffic. And most of them performed worse than the census tracts surrounding them. So you can sort of see that those off, all the, those suburb, suburban office was hurting too. Whoops, uh, jumped one. Um, so, yeah, so while ground floors in Atlanta's urban and suburban office districts suffered similarly though, I think there's some interesting way, they're each trying to thwart the doom loop in different ways. And this is gonna be interesting to track over time. Atlanta's downtown, like many others, is betting on retrofitting those office buildings into residential. And you know, there's a very, some it works, a lot of them it doesn't, and it's taking time and it's expensive. Um, and a few of the, their down, the, the office buildings are trying to now, they had internalized their cafes. Now they're putting them out onto the street. They're trying to improve. So this is an example that they're uh, really trying to make that access to the underground mall um, right along the main street, but really make this a plaza that really is inviting bringing people in much more of an extension of the street into this building and also 
a pulling out of the retail. Um, but the, so they have, but the, the urban spots, they're, they're kind of confined. There's not much space to move. They can only work within. So uh, the suburban office clusters, their strategy is they're retrofitting their parking lots with a mix of uses, gathering spaces, smaller footprint ground floor retail, ready to accommodate being omni-channel retail delivery, showcasing all of these other kinds of retail trends. Both of them, I would argue, are urbanizing both what the, uh, the office, the downtowns and the suburban, but it's so much easier to build on parking lots than it is to actually make those changes within the urban. And so with hybrid here to stay, um, I think it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, it's unlikely that all of these activations are going to succeed. I think we're gonna just plain say, we're seeing a drop in the amount of urban space. In some cities, there is evidence that as we drop the urban, the amount of urban space, we're seeing ground floor retails uh, do well. But it's, uh, I think many ground floors are going to have to be creatively repurposed. And they're gonna, frankly, Today's dying office buildings and office parks are yesterday's dead malls, and they should be look. There's a lot the downtowns can frankly learn from what the dead malls have been doing. So the conclusions were still confounded. <laughs> are our models simply too crude? Relying on census tract data to try to look at built environment is not great. Um, there's really too little suburban ground floor retail, floor retail, and it's probably too soon to see the impacts of increased work from home by choice, which really increased in 2022, seems to have plateaued and slightly decreasing now. Our data definitely shows that ground floor retail in suburban form outperformed urban retail. There's outperformed the urban. Uh, but everyone we talked to kind of said the retail, the real estate industry is convinced that the way to get employees back to work in the office is with more urban form and lots of ground floor retail. So um, this week, we got even some more interesting research out of Bloomberg that the 50 highest PUMAs, another census designation, Overlap that, that have the highest work from home overlaps very closely with the 25 PMAs containing the highest percentage of college educated folks. And yet those folks are the ones who are least likely to leave their enclaves to go to work in the downtown urban districts. So we're actually really looking at income. I think there's a lot more um, that we could be doing. We also in our, we did a regression and our research kind of showed slightly differently, it, we showed that workplace work from home is associated with lower incomes, lower car ownership, lower ground floor retail, and more people of color. Perhaps in the end, just what all these confounding trends reveal is how divided and fragmented rich and poor people place and places are in both urban and suburban environments, or it's just our models are bad, so that's it. <laughs> Uh, it's very interesting uh, uh, data, and it's great to actually get some numbers for these things. Uh, one of the things that that Vancouver study that I talked about. And I want to invite Elin and June to come up because they're co authors really on this. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Just keep going, Gary. One of the things that the Vancouver study found, and it's not quantified, is that in fact a lot of the work from home was not their primary uh, job. That is that a very large fraction of people in suburban areas have second jobs that are being done at their homes. And I, I have a sort of firsthand uh, uh, look at this. I have a daughter who's an emergency doctor in Reno, Nevada, and several days off between shifts and other things, she's gotten herself involved in doing very beautiful soaps that are uh, sold over the internet mostly uh, on it in her garage. Mm -hmm. And she's now reached the point where she's going to hire some people to. Center. Not going to give up being a doctor on it, but you know this. And if you in the Vancouver study, what they found was that there were a lot of people who were doing mm -hmm. other kinds of jobs than what they were doing at their primary job. So a person uh, might be a, a high tech person who uh, who does uh, work for a company, 
servicing their, their systems, but he also repairs computers at home, you know, with the people mm -hmm. after work. And that's a pretty well significant piece of Norwegian, significant pieces of New England. There are retirees who aren't counted against working, mm -hmm. but in fact, they're actually working at home and doing all of these kinds of things. And so, in fact, that when people who entered the competition went out and looked at neighborhoods, what they found was those suburban neighborhoods already had a tremendous number of people doing work at home, even though they mm -hmm. probably wouldn't be counted. In, yeah. In that, uh, yeah, the way that ACS counts it. Think, yeah. I think that's an important Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Mind, I mean, do you have any data on that? Some of the travel surveys are actually, uh, if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna like research some like the commuting patterns, some of the travel surveys actually have the data of asking people their question, like how many jobs they're doing, and graphic day jobs or whatsoever. But there's, I think, in our data used in this study right now, there is not particularly distinguished the the secondary or the primary job. Yeah, so the, currently the mobility that we get is from uh, a data provider for the state of graph. So what they did is they, they tracked anonymous mobile phone data. So, but when they handed them over us, the like the trajectory completely maps. You only know like a visitor from this block to that block, but by car, by foot, we don't actually know because they, they match that. Right? <laughs> How we anonymize the data? Couple of questions for Kian and then right. Alan, Jim, Zubin, thank you so much. So, Kian Gua from UCLA. I have a question. Um, question is David Klein, just looking at your example of the retrofitted mall. And um, the, let's see, yeah. observing that it is still a kind of like suburban mall with a with suburban symbol ground floors, right? So we still need the parking, we still need the mm -hmm. box in order to mm -hmm. have the configuration. And I think it's super interesting, you know, like it makes it easier for people to have the, that experience without having to, in this case, probably drive further. Oh, this is, yeah, this is 20 miles from downtown DC. Right. And I think it's a, it, you know, it's a super interesting model uh, for transportation, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious when you look at, at the Atlanta, the five counties, and you know the, the, the thing that struck me as imposing a transect, trying to look for transects in what is clearly like an, or to me anyway, like a new model of urbanization, or at least an urbanization that does not necessarily need to rely on any kind of transect. I'm curious why there seems to be an urge to impose that and to find conclusions based on, you know, in some ways like inherited ideas about urban and suburban, when Atlanta could be showing us new ways to think about how, mm -hmm. how to live. Work. I mean, it may well, part of what I was really interested in was though that there is a lot of redevelopment happening in Atlanta that is more urban form, transforming suburban form to urban form. And I was actually surprised how little of it showed up at a census tract level. So I see Atlanta becoming much more polycentric and that is actually the big hope for more tra for transit, if not at least micro transit is actually doing really well in, in the lower density areas of, so I do see actually much, some big, bigger patterns of change, but they'd actually, no, if you're just, I, I trust <laughs> the way these guys analyzed it, but it, at the census track level, they didn't show, those, most of that polycentric redevelopment is not yet showing up. What is showing up is that office clusters, but it, even those showed up as just low density on the on the measures of the transect. Even the transect is wrong. It, exactly. Yeah. It, it, it might be. <laughs> we take one more question while we already have Anastasia set up over here so we can yeah. stay on track. Yeah. So I think uh, Connor Tigger University also I think what you're seeing is actually quite hopeful for your research agenda in market failures. It's another cycle of delusion in the real estate industry in your conclusion that they still think that retail is going to solve it all, right? which, is, uh, which is not true. Well, they think, uh, they think great ground floor. So actually, I had some of the uh, one big developer 
Well, you know, yeah, we're, we're really trying to hire the best artists to do their roles because we know we can't fill all the ground floor space. We're trying to you know, be there. But yes. My, my question to you is, it's almost like your, your future research question is retrofitting retail spaces. Uh, this is no longer a space of transaction. It's a space of interaction. What examples have you seen other than growing pot? Uh, <laughs> oh my God, I mean, all sorts of stuff. So the number one, so if I just use malls, the number one reuse of malls is actually as office space, jobs, which is kind of surprising. I was a little surprised by that, but um, absolutely number one, whether that'll continue now, I'm going to guess that's declining. But uh, number two is kind of a tie between healthcare and education uh, as far as the, the reuse is going in. And after that, it's, it's quite a grab bag of a lot of different things going into malls, into dead malls. But I think the reuse, I mean, you just see some really interesting things going into mall spaces that you just would not expect. It's, um, the, the zombie paintball always gets some attention. The, uh, the playing on the apocalyptic uh, nature of, of the, the, these dead spaces. You know, schools that are now in malls. Um, lots of, lots of them, lots of them. Thank you very much.